Psalms 141, a Psalm of David. And as we've been doing the last two Psalms, we're, going, we're moving from separation. We move from separation to wicked people in Psalm 140. 141, we're going to look at the, the wicked people. David the writer says, Lord, I cry unto thee. Prayer. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. He, he, David's in a frenzy. He's in a panic. He's crying out to God. He's saying, God, answer me now. And we're so humble enough to say we've never prayed like that. How foolish David is. No, he's not. We've had prayers like that. We return to God and say, God, are you listening? Are you taking care? Let my prayer be set forth before thee. It's a prayer, verse 1. As incense. And we're going to see that in Luke 1. You see it in Revelation 8, 3. So the fact is that that, that prayer altar, the incense altar, was known to David. That God smells that incense and it's likened to prayer. That's not something you just dug up, you know, here we are in the New Testament church and, and you know, some kind of re revelation that is foolish. No, David said prayer and incense. And we're going to be running that in, in a short time in Luke. We'll see that. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, that sacrifice was a lamb and out holding hands. Now listen, if you truly want to put your hands out for the Lord, honestly to serve the Lord God, there's nothing wrong with that. You're showing that, listen, in between my hands there's nothing. I, I don't hold nothing. It's all you, God. Everything in my body. But there are people who do this. Just to be shown, to make a spectacle of themselves, for people to look at them. It's a holy roller show. They probably do it and they don't even know why they're doing it. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. David's doing it the right way. And I, I understand, listen, if you really love the Lord, and you're not going to do it for a show. You probably do that, if you do it in the church, you probably do that in your prayer closet. There are people in the church that do that, and that's the only time they do it, for people to look at them. I've seen those people. I've been in those churches. If you're holding out to God, set a watch. That's a guard, a watchman. O oh Lord. Before my mouth and keep the doors of my lips. And James says, listen, that tongue is unruly. That tongue is a flame of fire. And you want control of your mouth? Do what David just did. Lord, you shut my mouth. That's exactly what happens with Ezekiel. God says, listen, I'm going to make you dumb. You're not going to be able to speak. Only when I tell you to speak, you're going to speak. And listen, the angel Gabriel told uh John the Baptist's father, you're not going to be able to speak because you didn't believe me. We'll get to that in Luke. You're not going to be able to speak for nine months. Now, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste with haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands. As the evening sacrifice, set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. I don't know if David said anything wrong. <laughs> is it something that David said that, he, Lord, you just shut my mouth. My mouth has got me in trouble. Because the prayer says he's speaking to God with his mouth. And he's telling God, God, you got to keep my mouth shut. Now, I don't know. But I do know one thing by living as a human being for the over 40 years that I live. There have been times in my life that my mouth has got me in trouble. And the only thing that got me out of it was by the, 
by the prayer to God. Or walking up to the problem, just facing it and dealing with the trouble that this mouth causes. But you want a mouth that, 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 for control, turn it over to God. Lips. Set a watch, Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. You want a prayer? You want a chapter and a verse in a book that you can say, Lord, keep that cigarettes and those cigars out between my lips? There's a verse right there for you. Keep the door of my lips. Let them not be open for that pervertedness. Incline not my heart to any evil thing. How's that? I believe the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. I was talking to a brother in the Lord on Facebook about a title of a of a series I'm going to be doing about Jezebel. You know, I like the title, but it just didn't, doesn't seem right. And we've been writing back and forth. I want to make sure that I don't offend anybody. But yet, I don't I, offense is, you know, in the word, okay. If you're offended of God's word, that's fine. That's between you and God. But I personally don't want to do anything that looks evil. A Christian does not go walking down the street with a brown bag and a Pepsi bottle. It looks like something else. If you're going to deal with a prostitute and you're on the street corner, better be two or three men and maybe with your wife and his wife too. It looks a little better. If you can hold it and bypass a bar and find another facility to go to the bathroom, if you can, bypass the bar and try to find somewhere else. Listen, I've been in that situation. I've had the Lord bring me somewhere. Where, wow. It's open. It's usually closed instead of using a bar. Where I could have gone in that bar to use a facility. And, Lord, <laughs> i got to go. Get in that vehicle and just drive down the road, take a left, and there you Wow. Okay, Lord, thank you. So... You guys stay from all appearance of evil. If it looks bad, don't do it. To practice wicked works with men that work in iniquity. Now there's your separation. You hang around with men with iniquity, you're going to get into their ways. That's why God says, get away from them. You're going to fall. You're a sinner. A man, uh, listen, there's there, there a preacher back when the revival struck through America, and this man got saved, and the preacher told, the, the evangelist told the preacher, that man will never last. Because wait a minute, he just got saved. Uh, how can you say that, Mr. Evangelist? Because I saw him the other day, and he hitched up his horse right by the bar that he drank his entire life. And within time, that guy failed because he kept showing up where he where his sin was. I know another guy who was a sodomite. Got saved, got on fire for the Lord. You know what his problem was? He went back to the bars and dealt with the sodomites about the Lord. You say perfect. That's not that was not the place for him because he fell back to his sin. You got to get away from those people. That are going to destroy you. You may have the best intentions, but are they God's intentions? This is a prayer of David after a serious prayer that he has in his life. He says, Lord, listen, not only do you answer my prayer, but I don't want to sin. I want this prayer answered. And let me not eat of their dainty. That's special kind of food. That's sugary food. That's food that just tastes so good. You see them at, at parties and uh, hors d'oeuvres and 
desserts. And I don't, I don't want to eat high on hog. I don't want to get into trouble with sugary stuff that I shouldn't be involved with. I'd rather have herbs and eat with trouble. And you'll find that in Proverbs as we as we go into Proverbs soon. All right, now verse five, you got to read a few times because if your first time reading through, okay, I'm going to read my five chapters. Blah, 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 and you might have missed the point because I did. I had to read this four times. Then I had to read it up on the screen of my computer. Like, oh, okay, now I see. Let the righteous smite me. That doesn't sound right. There was a prophet in the, in the Old Testament. He goes to the guy, he goes, smite me. He goes, no, I ain't going to smite you. The lion's going to kill you. And the lion went and killed him. He went to another guy, he said, smite me. And he, and he says, he smite him enough to, to hurt him. He had a message to the king. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. It shall be a kindness. Now, where can it be a kindness if a righteous man smites me? Reproof. Or somebody takes me off to a side and says, Brother, I want you to read this passage in the Bible here. You're not doing it right. Brother, you're doing something that's wrong. And he's doing it for the Lord, and he's doing it with kindness. Yeah, it's going to smite me. It's, listen, your, your ego, your, your pride in you, and your, the madness of you, you're going to get angry. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, like anointing. If he's doing it in love, he's doing it in the Lord, and he loves you. Don't take it wrong. Take it as a holy anointing that you, listen, you don't, you don't see yourself as other people see you. You may have something on your cheek. Don't get mad because they say, you know, you got a little something on your cheek. Which shall not break my head. not a deadly wound for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamity the guy that came to me says you got a little problem in your life here when he falls into trouble I'm going to pray for him because I know he prayed for me or is praying for me and in his troubles whether it's my dealing or not I'm going to offer a prayer for him if I have something to say about it or if I don't have something to say about it. How's that? It doesn't say Jesus something about Jesus saying that you've gained a friend. You know, you take it to the person personally. You don't go to the church right away. You don't go to others right away. You go to the person and Jesus said, listen, if you two agree on the matter, you've gained a friend. You gained a brother. You got a spiritual bound between each other. Let somebody try to mess you up when that brother loves you. And then when something in your life comes up and you got troubles, that person that you went to that loves you, now you've got that bound. Now they're praying for you. That verse took a little while of reading. It's an aid one to another. In the Lord. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, and this is the world, this is the worldly godless judges. They shall hear my words, for they are sweet. The words of God. There are people that we deal with, there are people who knock on doors, there are people who pass out gospel tracts that these people's lives have been overthrown. They may not be a judge. They just may be a common person. But you may be preaching on the street and the Lord give you a message that somebody's life is in terror. Someone's life is in trouble. And you may give them words that are sweet. That's what it's about. 
There's been times that when I preached on the streets and the Lord has changed the direction, I don't know why. There are things on the street that somebody will say, why did you say that? And probably my answer would be, that's the Holy Spirit. And I know if you were like, that's not the Holy Spirit in you. I don't know. Maybe sweet. But don't you be a sweetie preacher. Because listen, too much sweet will make you a diabetic preacher. A diabetic Christian. And you can die by diabetes. You better have some salt. You need salt in your life. Salt is vital to the human body. You better have some salt. You better have some sweet too. It's very good every once in a while to have a dessert after a meal. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth. Doesn't look like a burial. As when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. You think of a pile of wood, and that's what he's saying there. There's a pile of bones. It's stacked up. Death. A lot of death. I mean, the human body is not going to make a pile like, like wood. It's going to take a lot of people to make. But my eyes are on thee, O God the Lord. If your eyes are on the Lord and doing right, your mouth should not be troubled. It's when you take your eyes off the Lord. When you are set upon God, you won't need to worry about doing wicked works. It's when you close your eyes is the trouble. And you've got, to, when you're dealing with people, you've got to close those eyes to them and say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Who is this person I am dealing with right now? I have had in my life, I had had Christians and they have been more destructive in my life than anything else. And I went their ways because I didn't seek God truly. Had I kept my eyes on the Lord, had I sought the Lord in prayer, things would have been a lot different. In thee is my trust. I think we have something like that on some green stuff that floats around in America. I, there was a, something today, you know, do you think we should still keep in God we trust on the money? Why? They don't. It's only a lie. 99% of the people that hold that stuff, it's a lie. For me, it's the truth. In God I trust. For any five people I pick out a random. Four out of five is not going to be God in their trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Now it doesn't say body. It says soul. When you die, everything your body has does not go with you. But what you acquire for your soul is what will go with you in eternity. Now today, for the born-again Christian, when your soul enters that eternal phrase called death of the body, or rapture, if the Lord comes, before I die, Everything you've done for Jesus Christ will not be destitute. It will be a reward. Everything I've done for self would be destitute. 
And there are Christians out there that will have absolutely nothing accounted to their soul at the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, you may bring a U-Haul to a funeral. You may have a big U-Haul in a trailer. And a big U-Haul in a trailer. And a big U-Haul in a trailer. And a house mover. And a big boat trailer. But what's that count to eternity? Everything for Jesus Christ. That will not be destitute. Keep me from the snares, that's traps, which they have laid for me. Who? The wicked. And the gins, that's not a drink, that's a trap. Of the workers of iniquity. I'm kind of thinking that verse, verse 9, and what do you do when that verse applies to people who are in a Baptist church and try to stop you from doing what the Lord tells you to do? It throws a doubt on their salvation. What is a trap or a snare or a gin? We don't do that here. See, I, I let my light shine. You're being a fanatic. That's just too much. That's overboard. Well, anybody who wears doodads on their shirt to say they're a Christian, you know. That snares and gins that get you to stop serving the Lord. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes if they were saved, standing before Jesus Christ and judgment seat of Christ. I respect that for somebody at the Great White Throne Judgment trying to stop you. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, and they will. They may try to stop you, but they ain't going to stop Jesus. Whilst that I with all escape away from them. Who are the wicked that we've been talking about these three chapters? Jesus told you who they were. And he gave you a prime example. They're your mothers, your fathers, your sons, your daughters, your husbands, your wife, your children, your neighbors. Anybody who does not love the word and does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may even be Christians. There's one guy, the disciples come to Jesus, Jesus... This guy is casting out devils your name. Forbid him. Jesus said, no, he's doing a work. If somebody comes to you and gives you some water because you are serving me, they will get a reward. But those who are not doing anything are in trouble. Or those who are trying to stop you are in greater trouble. Won't be under offenses, Jesus said. Somebody's out there going to stop a Christian from trying to do what he's doing for the Lord. Satan will always try to find some way to do that job. But Jesus said, Won't be unto you if you can commit that offense. A free will.
sometimes you may be downplaying the judgment of your loved ones if you back off. I'm not saying don't pray for them. I'm not saying mail them tracks. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, listen, the more you get in their lives, the angrier they're going to get if they don't want everything to do with God. And the more that they're going to do and cuss you out and everything, and cuss your Savior, you may be bringing more judgment upon them. Just back off and let God work with them. David's own children destroyed his throne. Amen? You want to do that? Get out of my castle. Bye. Absalom, get out. Jesus didn't have anything to do with his brothers and sisters because they didn't want to have anything to do with him. You've got to take a stand and say, I'm going to follow the Lord no matter what. And that is a stand you've got to take the day you get saved, even if you don't know it or not. The first thing they'll tell you is you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. All right, now you need to get into a church, a Bible-believing church. You need to be baptized. Okay, get a Bible-believing church. I'll be baptized. Now you got to read your Bible. Okay, I'm going to read my Bible. God says to read the word, to study, to pray. Okay. Now, who are you going to serve? You can't serve both. You can't have both. You're going to serve the one. You're going to serve the other. You're either going to love the one or you're going to love the other. You can't have it both ways. That's why we have weapons and armor in Ephesians chapter 5, 6. Because it's not the people that are the enemy. It's Satan and his evil forces that they know the people that are there and they know what particular person to bring up. Satan does not need to bring the Budweiser guy to me. That Budweiser guy passes me every morning at work when I'm working. That guy does not bother me. I just think in my head what per perversion that guy is putting out there, but that has nothing to do with me. But when I'm sitting there at the lunch table and I'm having my, my, my sandwich, and I look over and there's a magazine and the car and the, and the cover page said, "Oh, our our version of the Ten Commandments don't get me, don't get don't cast death upon or something like that." And I open it up and inside the pages I open up is not I don't open up the Ten Commandments. I open up to a page in there that is a sin that applies to me. Now how how ironic that was. There is my sin just opening up a magazine that I didn't even know what was in there. I wanted to read about something else. And Satan and his crew know exactly who and what to put in your life to get you away from God. He knows who you love. He knows who you want. He knows what is your weakness. David's weakness wasn't his mouth. It was a woman. And Satan knew that. Bathsheba, don't you think it's time to go wash yourself? Where are you going? I'm going to go wash myself for some reason. <laughs> okay, David, take your walk. You know, David was not where he was supposed to be in the first place. Remember I said that you know, if you can bypass that bar, go somewhere else. Listen, you might step in a place where you don't belong and say, ah, number one, that's it. Got you. Next move, number two. David was not where he was supposed to be. Okay, he saw her washing. And then step number three, he took a second look. Look at that.
He never had to get David for alcohol. You've never read where David got drunk. And at the end of that, that ended up with adultery and murder. You better be careful where you walk, and you better be careful where you are in your life. You better make sure you are where God wants you to be. How do you do that? Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the doors of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing. To practice witness, w wicked works with men of that work in iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let me not enjoy their, their substance. And let the righteous smite me. God will always send somebody to tell you before he judges you. If you're about to fall, you better listen to what God has to say. I guarantee you between that first and second look, God spoke to David. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. You just get out of there. All right, you did it. Now face the consequences. And verse 8, But my eyes are on to thee, O God, the Lord, in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. That is that is what you got to pray. That's what you got to see. If you keep your eyes on God, you're not going to be destitute of your soul. Never mind, never mind the flesh. Don't mi never mind people leave you. Never mind you lose the job. Never mind you lose possessions. It is what God being in his sight and being what God wants you to be in eternity, earning crowns. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But the persecution that you suffer, you will win rewards. People, but nouns are not worth it. What is a noun? A noun is a person, place, or thing. A person, place, or thing, a noun is not worth losing your crowns for eternity. It is not. You know what Paul kept saying? Follow me. Follow me. Because Paul was doing right. Demas, you don't want to walk the way. You don't want to walk the way, the way is right with God. Bye. No, I'm not going to Thessalonica with you. I'm going to stay here. I'll be here if you want to get right. Mark. You big sissy mama's boy, you went back in a thing like that. Uh, I don't want you. Barnabas, you want to take the sissy? You take the sissy. I'll take Silas. Mark got right in the Lord. Mark did what was he was supposed to do. And Paul says, Mark, take him. Use him. He's God approved. Now, Paul did not go after Mark, and Paul did not go after demons. Paul did not go back to the Sanhedrin in their meeting. They said, okay, man, I, no. Uh, he left them. Matter of fact, those of his buddies that he thought was his pals, his, his close chums that, that would have meals with, and he'd sit down with scholarship issues, and sit down in the court of law, and then he knew the high priest. Those are the ones that put him in jail, and in bonds, and in troubles, and gave him the troubles of his life. By the way, the ones that Paul started churches, they gave Paul a hard time. Christians gave Paul a hard time. How many crowns do you think Paul is going to earn at the judgment seat of Christ? How many do you think Demas lost? Now, do you... Now, you need... Listen, people. Listen, people. 
I'm being dead serious right here. You now need to, Christians, you now need to make a point in your life right now on whenever you listen to this. This is August 27, 2014, but I don't know when you're going to hear this. But you listen to me right now. You need, at the point of hearing my voice right now, you need to say in your life, I am going to serve God no matter what for the rest of my days of my life right now. I don't care who, what, where, or why, or how. I don't care person, place, or thing. I am going to serve you, God, and God, by your grace, by your glory, by the armor that you've given me by prayer, Lord God, I am going to need your help. Lord, I want to be faithful, like Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want when you call, I'm going to be faithful. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have a crown laid up to me. Lord, it's going to be hard, but I need you. I need to set my eyes upon you. Verse 8. I need you to shut my mouth. I need prayer, verse 1 and 2. Or Lord, I'm backing out right now. You need to tell the Lord, listen, Lord, you ain't worth it. A noun is more important than you, Lord. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm happy with that, but goodbye. That is a choice that every Christian has to make in their life. You, There is no third. There is no middle of the road. Either you're going to serve God and go all along the way, and when you sin, put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and be forgiven, have God pick you up and bless you off, and get walking again, or say, God, you just ain't worth it. Thank you for saving me, but that's it. Don't have anything to do with you no more. That is it. That is a choice that you need to make. And you cannot be a Christian and go to a place of business that you deceive others to do your business and say, hey, I'm a Christian serving the Lord and knock on doors or whatever. You can't live the double standard. You may have to say goodbye to that job. Because that job does not fit the Christian life. You may have to tell somebody, bye. Or you may have somebody that you dear and care about say goodbye to you. But you got to reach to the mark. you got to reach to the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed hope. You may have to give up a hobby. I'm not going to mention a particular hobby. Any hobby. The money, the time, and the effort to do something for the Lord only. You got to set your path right now. Jesus Christ or anything else. And when you say Jesus Christ, let me mark you right now that Satan has you marked. You better go to Ephesians chapter 6. You better learn that armor and you better put it on and not take it off. Because if you say you're going to make a stand for Jesus Christ, you have got an enemy. Satan is not in the bar room. No true Bible believing, soul winning Christian is in the bar room. And you better be willing, verse 5, to help your brothers, your comrades in arms. You better help a fellow soldier in Jesus Christ if they fall. You better not kick them and mock them or shoot them in the back. Be willing to pick them up, help them, dust them off, and help them get going. And that may even be picking up a Christian and working with patience with them to help them to grow. Who knows what the Lord will have you do. And when you get to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, 
and you are standing before Jesus Christ. Your choice, whether Jesus or noun, person, place, or thing, will be revealed. Except for the preachers and the missionaries' crown, which I forget the name of that one. But the four crowns that are offered to Christians, if you earn one, you earn two. If you earn two of them, you earn three of them. You know, there's a crown that said that there's a martyr's crown. Well, I'll never get that. But that crown is also applied to those that endure temptation. How about that? You can get a crown that's given to martyrs just by re resisting temptation, and you can have that crown. I don't get find the thing. I don't get into the study with the crowns I've done. It's amazing. It's like the Ten Commandments. You break one commandment, you're going to break another. And then you're going to break another. And then you're going to break another. It's amazing how the domino effect is for that. But you've got to choose today who you're going to serve. I think Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to leave you with a choice. And don't please me. You make your choice as your Christian walk before God who loves you. Jesus Christ who gave himself for you. The Holy Spirit that indwells in you. You make a choice right now. I'm going to serve God now or I'm going to serve self. Don't you dare say, well, tomorrow, you don't know what tomorrow will hold. I said, one night David's life was totally turned upside down. One night. You may put that decision off right now and, and tomorrow morning, your whole life where you... You won't be able to make a decision. God all has to do is put a, a, I understand, a dry piece of blood in your bloodstream that goes to your brain. And you might not be able to make decisions for the rest of your life. You might not even be able to use the right side of your body for the rest of your life. I'm not saying God's doing it, but I'm telling you right now, you now need to make a decision about your walk in God. Very important. That's a goal. Set, set goals in your life. Set a mark. My mark is Jesus Christ, and I flaunter all the time. I am a sinner. I fail the Lord all the time. But my eyes are still on the Lord. And he is loving and forgiving enough that for this miserable wrench that I am. And he still loves me. And he still helps me along the way. Nobody, no place, no thing is worth more than the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. That's my choice. I hope you choose it too. And you need help with prayer or anything, you just email me, call me. You can find my phone number and my email address on these places that I'm on. And I'll help you the best I can. These Psalms are very important. And Psalm 141. Psalms is a hymnal in your Bible. And there to be sung. In David's agony and in distress, I won't, we're running out of time. But this is a song of David. A psalm of David. Serve the Lord with your whole heart. If you go back in the past psalm studies that we've done, you'll see the study of a whole heart. Not half heart. Never half heart. It's a whole heart.
Salvation's plan is just a fairy tale, but their lies don't change the truth that Jesus died for you, and the word says his